Hi everyone, today we'll be looking at the classical civilizations of China. The classical civilizations of China include a period known as the Warring States period, as well as the Qin and Han empires. Um, first, as we look at this map, we can see that China is growing. It's getting pretty big, which then helps to determine that China is indeed an empire. Um, you hear a lot of people say, and as I've mentioned before, that China is an empire disguised as a country, and it continues to be so today. Um, so we can imagine what's happening within this is that one civilization is taking over lots of others and, is, and absorbing many different ethnic groups and linguistic groups. I don't want us to ever lose sight of that. Right? Even though we might think as, of China as one place, as one people, it's extremely ethnically and linguistically diverse. Right? Let's not overlook that. Um, and uh, also, we will see shifts between dynasties, right? One group will take over another. Um, but we can essentially think of China right, as one long-lasting empire. It's just about who's running it. So as always, as we do in all the societies that we study, let's look for some of those continuities, even if there are larger changes. But let's talk about the Warring States period. Okay, so before we get to the Qin Empire, the Qin Dynasty, which is very important, we have a long stretch of time that historians call the Warring States period. After the fall of the um, Xiaoxiang, Zhao Dynasty, um, no one family or no one um, clan is strong enough to overthrow in any you know long term the other, and so we have a, a period of sustained conflict where certain families are claiming that they have the mandate and others are claiming that they do. Um, so from 475 to around 221, we have a long period of war, right? People clamoring for the mandate of heaven. So even though we're not going to focus on any of those families, and even those that might have held power kind of um, centrally for a decade or two, um, we're going to instead focus on the philosophies that were born in that time period because they have the longest legacies. It's as if during this time of utter conflict, these various groups of people are sitting around and thinking, like, how do we regain order again in China, right? How can we create a Chinese utopia is the way that some of these philosophers have put it. And there are many philosophies that came out in this time period. But the three most influential ones are Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism, which I have starred on the side because this is the one that wins out at the end of this period of time, and it makes sense why. So I'm going to briefly talk about each of these philosophies, and we'll be looking at these throughout the year. Um, and in another uh, set of lessons, when we go over the religions and philosophies of this era, we can go further specifically into Confucianism and Taoism. But at the very least, we'll do an overview now so you can get a sense of what they are. So Confucianism... Um, uh, which is innovated by Confucius, a philosopher, emphasizes, as I say here, relationships and ritual and order. Taoism is a, a little more heady, kind of hippie-ish. The idea that there is a sense of universal harmony, um, there's a way that you can tap into. Legalism, as we'll see, is very straightforward state building, something that we will compare to concepts like real politic later on in European history. All right, so more on Confucianism. Confucianism um, is uh, born of the philosophies of Confucius. I'm also going to show you various spellings that you might interact with uh, via the book and other documents. So you might see Confucius spelled with a C or a K. That's just derivative of various schools of translations that exist um, when translating Chinese script right to um, Latin script. Um, but background on Confucius, right? he is born at really the beginning of the Warring States period. And that's important in terms of his point of view. Um, he saw the Zhou dynasty crumble. And so his whole thing is trying to figure out like what happened and how can we restore order and the greatness of the leaders of the Zhou dynasty. Um, ultimately, he was a failed politician that had a very strong following. But during his lifetime, he wasn't heavily respected um, or followed on any um, kind of grand scale. His major work, his major book, um, The Analects, it was written posthumously, essentially it's a collection of his quotes and lectures he gave to his students. And after he died, they compiled them into this book. And the Analects, like I said, are a series of quotes and lectures and lessons on how not just a government should work, um, which he does talk about 
you know, rule of law um, and the relationship between the ruler and the ruled, it more often talks about people's personal relationships or themselves. And that goes back to that concept that if people have orderly personal relationships, if their family is ordered in a way that people function properly, um, if people respect each other and take care of each other in a particular fashion, if everyone's doing that in their own home, then that will translate to a greater world order. Okay. And the other thing about the Analects is you know the Analects. The Analects um, is probably one of the most quoted books, uh, sometimes in really cheesy ways, like inspirational posters and whatnot, but these are like some famous quotes from the Analects. I just grabbed these off of Google. You know these things, right? Choose a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I'm sure you've heard some people say that before or like seen some inspirational post that your aunt put on Facebook or something. It doesn't matter how slowly you go, so long as you do not stop, right? Or the teachers love, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand, right? Stuff like that. Um, Where's my favorite? Oh, this one's my favorite. Before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. Right? So the idea that um, if you are vengeful, yes, you might hurt the person you're angry with, but it will come back to you. Right? You will hurt yourself. Um, right? So these types of things have floated around all the time. Um, he has his own sense of the golden rule. Right? Um, do unto others as you would do to yourself, which um, then predates the Christian ethic one. Um, so, I mean, historians debate which came first, etc. but the universality is here. Um, often many people know these quotes because these were some of the first things put inside of fortune cookies um, when the first Chinatown came about in San Francisco. So that popularized it. Um, so, so you know this stuff. You're already familiar with Confucius, whether you knew it or not. Um, but as I said, going back to how this played out in the Warring States period and how it will play out throughout Chinese history, is that, as I said, the basic concept is that political and social harmony arise from proper ordering of human relationships. And central to that is that in almost every relationship, there is a superior individual, right? That one person is, is more powerful for a variety of reasons. And that person who's powerful doesn't get to do whatever they want, right? They, it's not a free-for-all. Instead, they have a responsibility to take care of the inferior individual. And in return for that care, that inferior individual will be loyal, right? And then that cycle will lead to greater harmony. And within government, the people who should rule are the people who are deemed the junzi or the superior individual, um, also known as the gentleman. And you don't just get that title based on your birth, right? That instead, a junzi cultivates their superiority through education and through social consciousness, right? Which then brings us to the key virtues of Confucianism. At the heart of Confucianism is Ren, the sense of humanity, right? That you are a part of a greater human community and you can't be abusive towards others even if you have power, right? And think about it. That connects to the mandate of heaven. The emperor can't do whatever he wants. He has to take care of his people and in return they will be loyal. Um, the key virtue of Li is uh, how you essentially train your body and yourself to recognize those relationships. So it's a sense of propriety or secular ceremonial behavior. And you know these things. You've seen these things in East Asian culture, right? It is born in China, but anywhere that China influenced, which is most places in East and Southeast Asia, have taken on some of these properties, right? The idea that you bow to an elder, right? The idea that you might even use a different set of language, right, for an elder um, or someone who is superior to you. Um, I tell the story, and I'll, I'll tell you more in depth, that um, when I was teaching English to older Vietnamese immigrants for a while, even though they were older than I, in the relationship in which I was a teacher and they were the student, they referred to me as the great honorable Miss Mallon, right? So in another set of relationships out on the street, they are my superior because they are older. But in the sense that I was the teacher in that moment, then the relationship changed and the way they referred to me changed, right? Because of that moment, because of the changing relationship there. And we can talk about other um, ways in which this plays out um, at, throughout the year. And then lastly is shower, sense of filial piety, um, which I'll talk about 
within the context of the five cardinal relationships. So these are the five cardinal relationships um, within Confucianism that are the most important ones. And if these are the ones that we get right, then society will be harmonious. So the first relationship is between the ruler and the subject, right? And this is the idea of the mandate of heaven, that the ruler must take care of his people and return, the people will be loyal. But of course, if the ruler becomes corrupt, the people no longer have to be loyal and they can rise up, right? So there's that. The second most important relationship is between, it's often written in Confucianism as father and son, but of course it, it really relates to the parent and child, right? And this is the concept of filial piety, that the parents will take care of the child and in return that child should unquestionably listen to the parent. In our modern context, this has led to the idea of the tiger mom, right? Or these like very forceful um, some people might say overbearing parents who make their children do certain things. And the idea is that they're not trying to be terrible to their children, but the reason they want them to do a lot of homework and be involved in a lot of activities, right, and that they are micromanaging their education is so that they will be successful. Um, so this idea is super central and very widespread throughout East Asia because of the impact of Confucianism um, throughout that region. Uh, there is the third cardinal relationship, which is between husband and wife, which is showing the patriarchal elements of Confucianism. We'll see that this becomes extremely exaggerated by the time we reach the end of the Tang and beginning of the Song dynasties, when people begin to bind the feet of their wives to show that they are not only um, uh, kind of within just like a gender, basic gender way, reliant on the husband, that they become physically reliant on the husband when their feet uh, become bound and pretty much disabled at that point. Um, within siblings, older brother and younger brother, right? The younger brother is the inferior. The elder brother is the superior. The only equal relationship should be between friends. And the idea is that you should keep company that supports you and pushes you to be better. Right, so these are the basic five cardinal relationships. And as I said, we'll be looking at the impact of Confucianism throughout the year. The other major philosophy is Taoism that comes about in this time period. You might see it spelled with a T or a D. Don't freak out, same word, just different translations. The founder of Taoism is Lao Tzu, um, and the major work um, is the Tao Te Ching, or the Way of Virtue. Um, and the main idea is that <clears throat> Um, everything is ordered by the Tao, that there is a, a universal energy um, that exists everywhere. And all your actions should be in accordance with the Tao. And if you don't act in accordance, it creates the discord and imbalance, which Lao Tzu and other Taoists believed was creating the chaos that led to the horrible warring states period. Um, the famous quote about the Tao is that it's so spiritual, right? It's so um, abstract that those who know the Tao do not speak of it. Those who speak of it do not know it. Um, and the symbol of Taoism is the yin-yang or the taijutsu or the idea that um, in the yin and the yang, that there are opposing but equal forces of energies that maintain the balance of the Tao. But one thing that's important to note with that is that ultimately everything is the same, right? And in that way, we'll see it is very similar to some of the concepts we'll study in Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, because even though, let's say, the opposing forces in this case are dark and light, the little white dot within the dark is a reminder that, that lightness is within the dark, and in this case, darkness is within the light, right? Let's say that um, we our opposing energies are masculine and feminine, right? But masculine is not only masculine, it is also feminine, right? And oppositely, feminine um, has the masculine in it. That there may seem to be opposing forces, but those opposing forces at a universal level are the same, right? And so when someone acts out of the Tao, it doesn't just hurt them, it hurts the Tao, and everything gets thrown out of whack. Um, so as I already mentioned before, and just giving you some of the other spellings as well, um, the Tao Te Ching, um, uh, says the, the way that can be followed is not always the constant way. So when people are affecting the Tao, the Tao moves. And so you have to find your way back to the Tao. 
right? It's the idea of flexibility and the universality that our souls are all connected. All energy is connected. It's really out there. I love it. Um, the way they describe the Tao, I love this stuff, is it's the energy that does nothing yet accomplishes everything, right? It is, it is nothing and everything all at once. So Tao is sometimes described the Tao as the hole in the pot. And if you think about a vessel, if you think about a pot, I have to ask the question, what is the most essential part of the pot? You know, is it the bottom? Is it the sides of the pot? And Dallas argue that the most important part of the pot is the nothingness in the center. It's the hole in the pot. Because if the pot were filled all the way up with clay or with metal or whatever material you made the pot out of, what's the point of the pot where you can't put water in it, you can't put rice in it, you can't put whatever you want inside it without the nothingness. So even though there was nothing, it is everything. It is all the potential. Similarly, the idea of the hub of a wheel. If you think of a very basic cart wheel, the hub itself has a huge ring of just nothingness in the center of it, and that is where all the spokes connect. So it is made of nothing, but it accomplishes everything. Another major virtue of Taoism is the concept of Wu Wei, or the removal from worldly affairs or lack of action. And the deal within that, it has to come really with the idea of nature, that nature doesn't do much, meaning like it has patience, right? There's less action. And from that non-action, there is balance. And then if you, become, if you create too many rules, if you, keep, if you try to get too involved in manipulating the environment, or even in the case of manipulating laws, that that throws the Tao totally out of whack, right? So Taoists instead, did, they believe in education, but only insofar as it helps you get in touch with the Tao. Over-education messes with the Tao. And that for yourself, if you want too much, if you become too materialistic, that throws the Tao off. And then within government, they believe the less government, the better. That if you create too many laws, then you lose the essential law, which is the law of the Tao. Um, their other virtues are compassion, moderation, humility, um, things that do connect very well with Buddhism when that comes into uh, China. And they do believe in gods. So we're not going to get into all the gods, um, but they do believe in them, right? And you see those often take form in guardians on, um, on architecture. And we'll be keeping our eye on Taoism, so I'll show you examples throughout the year. Um, but in terms of guardians and also eventually the concept of feng shui or balance within architecture um, is a Taoist idea. Um, and the gods, unlike some other um, religions, the gods are not perfect. The gods are deeply imperfect in Taoism as a reminder that we are imperfect, right? And that um, we all need to do better, right? So that unto itself is, is, a, is a lesson. Um, and the other thing I want to mention, um, as I already did, but take another second to do so, is the importance of nature in Taoism. Um, that Taoists looked at nature as a role model, right? Or as in this inspirational poster quote of Lao Tzu, uh, nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished, right? So they're looking at the, like a biosphere and recognizing that everything gets what it needs, right? Animals eat enough to survive, but they don't cause the genocide of other animals. Um, you know, plants and animals get what they need. And of course, we know that invasive species can hurt, but like just within a natural environment, most plants and animals get what they need without destroying the others. So Dallas began to look at nature to say, all right, how do they do it and how do we mess it up? How can we be more like nature? Um, and so due to their deep, deep respect for nature, Taoists become some of our first uh, natural scientists in early Chinese history, right? Observing nature, recording it, um, and uh, creating some of the first early biological texts. One of the ironies is that when studying nature, some Taoists discovered saltpeter, which is the essential component in gunpowder. So some of the most nonviolent people who wanted to create the least action in humanity discovered arguably the most destructive force in human history. So that's a bummer. Um, but anyway, moving on. Uh, legalism. All right, so legalism is the philosophy that quote-unquote wins out over the others in the creation of the first major dynasty after the Warring States period, um, which makes sense because 
Confucianism, while it would be the most important socially, at this point isn't strong enough to shut down the wars and centralize a government. And Taoism is far too heady at this point. It's, it's never going to be a political philosophy. It'll be more of a personal and social philosophy. Um, Han Fei, excuse me, Han Fei writes the Han Fei Zi, which um, is the most important legalist text coming out of this time period. And the general thesis, as I have stated here, is that the ruler's responsibility was to create ideal laws which would ensure the smooth functioning of his government. Legalism assumed that everyone acts according to one principle, the desire to avoid punishment while simultaneously trying to achieve benefits. Thus, the law must reward those who obey it and severely punish any unwanted action, right? With the heavy emphasis on that last part there, severe punishment for stepping out of line. Um, essentially, this is totalitarianism. And um, the Qin Dynasty will adopt extreme legalism. And thus, we begin a bit of a pattern in Chinese history that there will be other warring states periods, um, one key notable one. And after that warring states period, legalism will always win out because it's, it's forceful. So there will be a legalist dynasty that follows a warring states period. But all of those legalist dynasties are short-lived because they are super repressive. The peasants get abused. Um, the other noble families become very resentful. There's often a lot of censorship, so the academic and intellectual classes are unhappy, and so it leads to rebellion. And then it is almost always replaced by a Confucian dynasty, which seeks to balance everyone's needs, and usually those Confucian dynasties last much longer. So let's talk about the Qin dynasty. The Qin dynasty is the dynasty, um, the family, that is finally able to subdue all the other warlording families and to centralize China for the first time since the fall of the Zhou dynasty. And as you'll note here, it's a short-lived dynasty, 221 BCE to 207 BCE, so super short, but highly impactful. You know, in fact, if we think about the name Qin, um, it is so impactful that people began to refer to this region after the Qin family forever. Um, so we have to spell it instead of a Q, but instead with a C-H-I, just add an A at the end of it and we get China, right? So the way we refer to China harkens back to the Qin, right? That's how deeply important, right, this dynasty is. All right, so what's up with the Qin? Um, the Qin began to expand and bring in all of these different ethnic groups under its rule. And this is a look at the modern borders of China and the breakdown of ethnicities in China. Just as a reminder that China is diverse, right? There's no one Chinese group, right? There are so many different ethnic groups and linguistic groups in China. So in the light blue is the largest ethnic group, the Han Chinese, which is the most, um, is the most common ethnic group in the whole world. Um, and so, uh, and the Mandarin language is often associated with the Han Chinese, um, not always, but generally. Um, and we can see all the other various colors. Um, so whether it's um, various Turkic groups in the far, far west, like the Uyghurs, who we'll meet later. Um, there's the Burmese, obviously the Mongolians um, are included within that, the Manchu. Um, there's so many different ethnic groups within China. So let's remember that. Um, and so just like the Persians, the Chinese have to figure out how do we keep all these different groups under the umbrella of our dynasty. The first emperor is Emperor um, Shi Hongdi, or Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Um, referred to various ways, and he's our super legalist, right? So his methods of centralizing China start by absolutely crushing all local autonomy. So anyone who considered themselves a feudal lord or a warlord, he crushed them, right, through his military. And then those people who survived, he forced them to move to his new capital. So just like the Persians, he's building a new capital, um, which is in modern-day Shenyang, um, and force the people to move there. By moving to his capital, he can A, keep an eye on them so they're not doing anything you know, against him. And B, these people, their pride isn't going away. Right? They still are feudal lords. Right? They think of themselves as pretty important. And so what they'll do is to both um, show their power to also possibly gain favor with the emperor. They're going to build beautiful buildings, beautiful homes, 
um, theater, stuff like that, to show their power in some way or another. So this is a win-win for Chen Chi Huang, because not only can he keep an eye on his competitors, but his competitors are making his capital beautiful. And one way to legitimize your power is by you know shows of of splendor. And he has the most beautiful city in China, right? So furthering his power, he also was. Um, you know, uh, very harsh towards any dissenting opinions. Um, so there's a great deal of censorship. Um, so he was known to execute many Confucian scholars, especially, um, to burn so many books, um, kill and like in very horrible ways, any dissenters. There's also believed that he killed a lot of his own family because he believed they were plotting against him, which they might have been. But he was also really paranoid um, due to his consumption um, of mercury, which we'll discuss in just a second. But I also want to take a second to talk about the possibility of propaganda, right? So modern scholarship questions just how many people he killed or how many books he might have burned. It's pretty well accepted that he definitely had a policy of censorship, but maybe some of it was exaggerated later by the Han dynasty in order to legitimize their own power and their usurping of him. Um, I don't know fully right, what the answer is. I'm kind of back and forth on it. Um, but it's always a possibility that something might be exaggerated uh, for the benefit of an incoming power. But it's definitely noted that he employed a great deal of censorship. Um, and as I said, in terms of one way to legitimize your power is through your, your show of artistic, architectural splendor. There may be no better example than that than his tomb. Um, so Emperor Shi Hongdi's tomb, um, or uh, many people know the Terracotta Soldiers, is, uh, is a great show of that. Um, so only discovered a couple decades ago, and uh, there's still a lot that has not been uncovered, um, is a gigantic tomb um, in which he forced um, artisans to move to this one region and to build him a tomb that he believed would give him a great deal of power in the afterlife, right, in the realm of the ancestors. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers that he would employ in the afterlife and it's also believed that wherever his actual body is, that uh, it is surrounded by like a moat filled with mercury. And mercury, um, people believed, had beautiful, like incredible powers. Um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous substance. We can talk more about it in class. Um, but essentially, we believe that consuming it or surrounding yourself with it would give you um, strength in the afterlife. Some people believed immortality. Um, but ultimately, it's uh, really toxic, and not only does it make you mentally ill, like really paranoid, um, it can give you cancer, um, so that doesn't work, um, but that's all part of the tomb. And if we look a little bit closer, one thing that's really interesting is that in terms of the faces of the soldiers, no two are alike. Their bodies might have been cast molded, but their faces were individualized, showing that this was a serious project. We'll see that the, Ch the Chin family conscripted or drafted a lot of labor. And it's not just labor to build roads or the Great Wall, but in this case, artistic labor, um, which is a show of power, but is adding to the anger that people have towards the Chin family. Um, a lot of horses, because he's showing up just as many, how many horses he has, which we know is very important to the success of a civilization. Um, all right, so other stuff that they did to centralize power, right? So taking over is one thing, right? How do we try to unify a society. The Qin Dynasty is responsible for a great deal of standardization, which other dynasties will take advantage of, right? So they do a lot of the dirty work that the Han will pick up on. So similar to Persia, they're gonna standardize things like weights and measures and law to keep everyone in line. And by standardizing weights and measures, it makes it easier to build, as well as more importantly, to do trade. So you know when going into a marketplace just how much something weighs and then how much it should cost versus having all these competing um, measurement systems. Now we have one larger one to improve trade. Also, um, they will standardize language and script. At this point, there's many languages and there's, there will continue to be many languages, but they choose one language as the central language, which is the language that evolves into what we know as Mandarin, thus why that becomes so popular. And we, um, or they, choose one central script uh, to centralize, you know, written language um, to make things easier. Um, so in that way, that helps later dynasties to stay centralized. Um, 
they will also, as I said before, conscript or draft so many peasants for large-scale projects, um, whether it could be local projects such as building roads and wells and dams. Um, but the, the, the greatest project was to build the Great Wall or the various sections of the Great Wall. Um, the Qin Dynasty is the first to start to build various sections of the Great Wall. Almost every dynasty will pick up and have to either rebuild due to invasions or build new sections of the wall. A reminder, there's a lot of myths about the wall. Um, you can't see it from space. And also, it's not one big wall, right? It's a series of walls that just try to fill in the gaps um, that natural boundaries, right, don't, you know, create, right, for the safety of China. Um, so here's a, a very beautiful image of the Great Wall. But the problem with the Great Wall is that it was really dangerous to build. Um, it was far away, so people would leave their hometowns. And a lot of people did die in the process of building the Great Wall, such that often once people were drafted for the Great Wall, families would hold funerals before they ever left to go build that project because they didn't expect them to come back. Um, most likely, though, the people were not buried in the Great Wall. That's another myth. They were most likely buried next to it, but not in it because that wouldn't be stable structurally. The other thing I learned while at the Great Wall is that the mortar, the stuff that keeps the bricks together, is sticky rice. So that's cool. Anyway, here I am at the Great Wall. I went in November, which meant that nobody was there because it was really cold. Um, so this is a rare picture of someone on the Great Wall without a million people around it. And this is a, a very popular section of the Great Wall. You can see it's snakes all over. It's super neat. You should go. And then this is just my favorite picture. I was trying to take a picture of this one temple behind me, and I got probably the greatest accidental photobomber of all time, that dude. So anyway, China School, we'll talk about more later. All right, the downfall of the Qin, um, it's pretty short. So um, as I said, it's it rises, it does some stuff, and it falls. Ultimately, people are tired of the abuse. There are a great deal of peasant uprisings because they're getting drafted, they're dying, and they're tired of working for them. But also other noble families and the intellectual classes begin to coordinate with the Han family who um, are claiming that due to the peasant rebellions and other abuses that the Qin do not have the mandate. And so other noble families work with the Han to overthrow the Qin. And then we have the rise of the Han dynasty. Okay, the Han dynasty is a handy dynasty. <laughs> handy dynasty. Okay, anyway. Um, uh, I say this because uh, their dates, when rounded, for me, help create a mental timeline. So even though I give you the dates here, like 206 to 9, and then there's a break, which I'll talk about, and then 25 to 220, I round it. And in my head, I always think of the Han Dynasty as 200 to 200, um, 200 BCE to 200 CE. We will have to get dates under wraps, and this to me is an easy one to remember, Han 200 to 200. Um, the break in the middle is a result of an emperor who attempted a socialist um, experiment um, to give more power and to divide more land up into the uh, peasant class. It unfortunately didn't work, and it led to the breakdown of the government for a period of time. The emperor's name was Wang Nang. Um, so that explains the break. If you remember that, cool. If you don't, fine. Um, but Han, 200-200. And it expands even larger than the Qin before it, as we can see. And this is where we start to see China really impacting other East Asian societies. Because here it goes north and begins to interact more with the Manchu people. And it's also snaking into Korea. So we'll see Korea shares a lot of culture with China because China took it over early on. And it must have worked for the people. Because remember, acculturation is active selection, not passive reception. So the Koreans must have found it useful or liked whatever the Chinese were giving them. Also, it's going to move further south, right, to take over what is now parts of southern China, and also further into um, Vietnam as well, as well as westward. So they're expanding their influence. Um, but one of the first things they do is they transfer from legalist philosophy, or right, as their state philosophy, to Confucianism. Um, for, for the first uh, emperor, it's kind of a mixture of legalism and Confucianism. Because they still need to be strong-handed, because there are still warlording families who are claiming that they should have power. But over time, they transition to more of a Confucian political philosophy. 
And that is because they don't want to anger the lower classes or the other noble and intellectual classes. They are trying to employ the idea that, yes, we have the mandate of heaven, but that doesn't mean we can do what we want. We need to take care of you in return for your loyalty. Um, and the other shift is rather than have like one leader and a close group of advisors to do all the work, which is essentially what Emperor Qin did, um, instead we create a very complex government just like the Persians had, or really more complex than the Persians had, right? A central government with a great deal of bureaucracy. Um, and even though the goal was to expand, they wanted that centralization to be affected or sorry, effective. So they transitioned from a policy of nepotism or giving people their jobs, their positions because of how they were connected to the family. And instead they shift to a policy of meritocracy, trying to find the best of the best of the best people to rule China. So they do this by creating a series of imperial universities um, scattered throughout the country, but usually closer to the bigger cities or a series of universities, and the idea is that your children, and of course they would generally be upper class children, anyone was allowed to go, but only people of the upper classes could afford, um, it, not that it was expensive, but could afford to lose the labor of their children. If you were a farmer, you needed your kids to be working on the farm, but if you're upper class, you don't need your kids to be laborers, so you can send them to the universities. And so people would go through school from, you know, their youth through, you know, what is kind of like a college education, right? So kind of a, a K through college education. And they would study everything. So it's not like you would major simply to be a general in the army or you wouldn't major to be a legal clerk. It was expected that people who worked in the Chinese government be extremely well-rounded, that yes, they should know the laws but they should also know the sciences and they should also know poetry and they should have perfect calligraphy when writing these types of things that you should be do. You should know everything. Um, and in order to get any type of job, you would have to take the civil service exam that if it was a low level position to be a clerk in a small town, that exam might only take a day, but the more prestigious of a job that you were going after these exams could go on for a week. And as I said, it's not just testing you on the stuff you would use in your job. It would be a fully comprehensive exam. If you think the SATs are hard, they're nothing in comparison to the Chinese civil service exam. Days long, limited bathroom breaks. You had to have perfect calligraphy. And as you can see here, you're often standing. So they're testing your knowledge, but they're also testing your will. Right. How badly do you want this? And you might be competing against thousands of other people sometimes right, for some of these top positions. So it means whoever gets the position is the absolute best of the best of the best. Um, there's also sad things that happen as a result of this. If people are caught cheating, um, they were often barred from ever taking any exam ever again. And since they then really dishonored their family, they might have committed suicide. Um, people who needed another bathroom break but didn't get one and then soiled themselves, similarly, never allowed to take the test again. Uh, so there's really bad stuff to it. But the positive is a meritocracy with very qualified people. And also, this is the birth of the, the, the love for education that people often associate with East Asia, right? If we think about competitive students, often people think of East Asia, right? Chinese students, Korean students, Japanese students, right? This is born of this time period. Um, so the Chinese have pushed education since like 200 BCE, whereas other societies way lag in that process. So it's all here. Um, I love this image because this essentially, um, this is in Seoul, Korea. So Americans have like Civil War reenactments, um, but Koreans and Chinese will have Confucian exam reenactments. So I love that. That's really goofy. Other major developments of the Han Dynasty, um, and we'll just study the Han more, but I'm just, you know, beginning to um, introduce some things to you via the Han. Um, first off is a state monopoly of iron. The reason for this is the Han emperor wants to know who has the ability to make weapons. 
Uh, they need to keep their eye on that because if you have weapons, you might overthrow the dynasty. Also, the expansion of the silk industry um, happens under the Han. People have been making silk for a while, but the government will invest money in the silk industry because they know it is a rarity and that it's going to make them a ton of money. They'll expand their infrastructure, so they need to help to rebuild the Great Wall, but they're going to pay their people better, um, as well as roads and dams and stuff like that. Also, while paper is invented beforehand, it is used uh, way more widespread under the Han, which leads to the production of more books of an educated and intellectual class. All good stuff. Also, the population booms tremendously. By the year 9, there's over 60 million people in China, the largest population by far in the world at this time period, which gives them a major competitive edge. Another development under the Han Dynasty is the rise of the Silk Roads, which we will study separately. But just remember, you cannot talk about the Silk Roads until you're talking about the Han Dynasty. Do not talk about the Silk Roads in connection with the Qin or any of the previous dynasties. Um, so this trade route just helps China thrive and makes the West more curious about East Asia because they have such cool stuff. Um, so there's a lot of really good things happening here, which is why the Han Dynasty is really the true classical civilization of China. All the later dynasties, like the Song and the Tang and the Ming, they want to be Han, right? Just like later European leaders want to be Rome, um, the Chinese leaders of the future want to be the Han. Um, so everything is like, wow, the Han were so great. But of course there were problems because over time, Wealth increases, but at some point corruption comes into play, and so wealth disparity also increases, which is one of the many factors that leads to its downfall. Um, I'm not going to go heavily into the fall of the Han because we have a presentation on that, but there are many internal and external factors. Um, so I'm going to leave that there because I've talked too much, um, and we'll pick some of this up in other lessons and via some presentations. Okay, bye.